Hey, designer, are you struggling with understanding copyright? What is it? What items you can and cannot copyright? Can you do it yourself? Do you need to hire an attorney? My name is Stacey Schilling. I'm a visual design expert. I know a lot about copyright because I'm an artist and designer and have been doing this for 30 plus years. So I understand copyright and copyright law. However, I have a really great friend that I've known for over 20 years named Mark Hankin. He is an attorney and he works for his own business, Hankin Law, and he specializes in copyright and copyright law. And I've asked him to be here today to answer questions that you might have regarding copyright law so that way you can get your questions answered. So Mark, tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure, Stacey. Well, it's great to see you. We, we have known each other a long time. I went to law school specifically to become a patent, trademark, and copyright lawyer. It's all that I've ever done. And uh, we get some pretty good, pretty good results for our clients and get good reviews from around the country and international surveys. But all I do is protect people's inventions, slogans, and creative works with patent, trademark, and copyright. Uh, I'm admitted in courts all across the United States. I have clients all over the country. And this is what I love to do. I love to protect creative people's creativity so they can go on and make more money from it and create more creative creative uh, works. How did you choose copyright law? Well, I started off in medical school and I hated it. <laughs> so um, I was very good in science and I found patent law. And there's an umbrella called intellectual property law, which includes patent, trademark, copyright. Not everybody who's an intellectual property lawyer can do all three like I can. Some do only one, some do only two. But for me, it was a natural progression because a lot of clients don't know what they need. They're not sure the differences between patents, trademarks, and copyrights. Even lawyers I work with aren't sure the real differences between those three. So I love to work with people and protect them and protect what they have in mind. So let's go through the three differences. What is the difference between copyright, trademark, and patent? So everyone has a clear understanding what those differences are. So patents protect a thing, a process for doing something or making something, or even a new article of manufacture or, or a, a kind of a product. It's an invention. And typically utility patents protect how something works, whereas design patents protect what something looked like. Think about the curved uh, uh, corners of an Apple iPhone, for example, and Apple and Samsung are out there suing each other over those things. Think about the different designs that you've seen. Uh, so it's the aesthetic aspects of otherwise functional products can be protected by design patents. Trademarks protect the source of origin of goods or services. It could be words, slogans. I always like to use the example of Nike because everybody understands that. Nike, that's the house mark, the brand name. Swoosh, that's the logo. Just do it, that's the tagline. And any of those three trademarks could be for balls, could be for clothing, or could be for exercise equipment. That's nine separate trademarks, depending on which trademark you're using and for which class of protection. It could be sounds like the NBC chimes. It could be for colors like the pink fiberglass uh, uh, insulation from Owens Corning. It could be actually for smells. It could be for sounds, all, all kinds of cool things. So it protects the source of origin of goods or services. Copyright, which we're gonna talk about in more depth today, protects something that is fixed in a medium. So it could be text, it could be pictures, it could be uh, uh, sculptures, it could be blueprints. It could be actually a house itself, not just the blueprints for the house. Anything that gets fixed in a medium. It could be music, could be movies, could be books and short stories. Uh, it has to have a, a minimum creativity. So it could just be one picture. They, they talk about you know little, uh, little bits of, of copyright uh, being different from something else and being copyrightable. But it has to be enough creativity that the Copyright Office thinks it's protected. So if you're an artist, or an illustrator or a children's book artist, which one, if you're doing say the illustration artwork for a children's book artist, what has copyright protection? What do you do versus if you're the writer or if you're like myself that does the illustration and the writing, could you go into a little bit of detail about those three entities? Absolutely, so let, let's start with the basics. When you fix something in a medium, you write something down, you draw something, you type something on your computer, you take a picture of something, you create music, but not just in the air playing it, but you actually record it or record a movie. You shoot a movie with your iPhone or with a, an actual movie camera. 
when you fix something in a medium, you own the copyright in it automatically. You don't have to do anything more. You should, in the United States, put a copyright notice on there. It's not required, but it's very helpful. See inside a circle, not parentheses, but a circle, the word copyright, the year of creation and or years that you modified it. So maybe it's 2019-2023, if you modified it each of the last four years. The name of the copyright owner or claimant could be you, could be your entity. We'll talk about more about that later. But whoever owns the copyright. And then get extra protection in other countries by adding all rights reserved, capital A, capital R, capital R, period all rights reserved after your copyright notice, and put that as a running footer on every page of your website, on every page of your book, put it at the front of your book, in your article, in your children's book, wherever it is, put that copyright notice where it can be seen. Now, in the United States, if you wanna sue on that copyright, you actually have to file a copyright application with the copyright office. And to do that, you have to fill out a form, you can do it online, you can do it yourself or hire an attorney, but it's good to fill out a copyright application, make sure you use the correct form, claim what's yours, disclaim what isn't yours, and file it with the government to get the copyright registered. It gives you a lot of benefits that you can sue on. Also, you can get statutory damages and attorney's fees if you file early enough. Now, you asked about, well, what if I only do the, the words and not the illustrations, or what if somebody else does the illustration? If you together, are creating a joint work of authorship. So you have joint authors. If they're doing it as individuals, they each own the copyright and they can share it, but you have an obligation in the United States to give contribution and an accounting. So in the United States, if you if you were to, let's say, Stacey, I know you do your own text and illustrations, but let's say you had an illustrator in there, or let's say you worked with someone else on creating a book. And you went out and got a $10,000 advance from a publisher who was going to publish it for you. You'd have to tell the other party, you have to give them an accounting and give them a contribution. You have to give them $5,000. So it would be much better to have an entity, and we can talk about different structures, but have an entity own it because maybe the operating agreement for the entity says instead of getting half, they only get 10%, or maybe you get 80%, they get 20%. And then you have to give them 1,000 or 2,000 instead of the 5,000 that the law requires. So it would be good to have that ownership owned by some sort of an entity. And to do that, you have to fill out an assignment form. You have to record that assignment form with the Copyright Office, because that way everyone can know who owns it and where the rights really are, so they don't do business with the wrong person. So if you say you're an author or even an illustrator, or in my case, an author illustrator, and you're doing a series of books, should you register each individual book with the copyright office? Um, and then should the author, if you're you're just writing the book, do just the author, you know, all their text and the illustrator do separately? Um, should you do all that? So you have an option. You can do just the text, you can do just the illustrations, you could do just for one book, you could do one book together with both text and illustrations. And then if you're putting, let's say you have a series of three children's books and there's, you know, part one, part two, part three, you know, the sequels, you could do all three together for a copyright. It's best, I think, to do each book separately because the Copyright Office has been cracking down on compilations. I used to tell photographers, okay, look, give me a contact sheet of 100 thumbnails and we'll register all 100 for the 100 different pictures. The Copyright Office is trying to stop people from doing that. It's a way of saving money, but the Copyright Office wants their wants their money. So they they don't want you to do that anymore. Plus, is it really substantially similar if you're copying just one of 100 things and you're not copying the other 99 things? How, you know, how much is too much? And there's no bright line. We all hear these old wives' tales. Oh, if you change it 15%, oh, you change it 20%. None of that's true, but the question is, is it substantially similar? So therefore, it should be just one work. But if you have created both the text and the illustrations, doing the full book is the easiest way to go and you use the correct form and you say, I'm, I'm, I'm protecting text and illustrations. If you're, however, the creator of only one of those two, you might put your text without the illustrations or you might put your illustrations without the text and file two separate copyright applications, one on the text, one on the illustrations, and they both protect 
some, but not all of that book. Then sometimes there's a cover art that may be the same illustrator, maybe different, maybe one of the illustrations from inside the book, and maybe that cover art gets more attention than something else. You might want to file that one separately if it's going to get uh, uh, more, more copies made. So it's important to think about that. Now, for myself, and this may be a question for some other people too. So I, in my kid's picture book series, the same characters are going to show up in book two onward. So in book two, book three, book four, five, and six, and so forth, as those books start to get um, released over time, those characters are all going to be the same. They're going to look exactly the same. Some of their emotions might change. Am I going to have to re-register those illustrations for those books going forward every time I put out book two, book three, book four, five, and six, and so forth? So presumably the illustrations in the later books are different from the illustrations in the earlier books. They may have some of the same characters, but the illustrations, the, the characters doing different things in the, in the pictures, typically. So the answer is yes, you should register each book separately because the text, the words are different, the pictures are different. Now, if you are using a character enough and using that character to identify a source of origin, it might have trademark rights. Typically, characters are a little hard to protect because they, they're, they're sort of a little bit of copyright, a little bit of trademark, a little bit, but you have to think about, are you using it to identify a source of origin of specific goods or services? Do they speak for your product? For example, Mickey Mouse speaks for Disney. Not only is Mickey Mouse copyrighted in the film Steamboat Willie, which is the original earliest uh, Disney copyright of Mickey Mouse, but also many times later, but Mickey Mouse is sold as well and identifies as a trademark the source of Disneyland or Disney World. You know you're not at Knott's Berry Farm or Universal Studios if you see that guy with the, the two big ears on his head. So that serves a trademark function as well as a copyright function. If your characters take on that kind of a role, and identify a source of origin of different goods or services, not themselves, but their good services of some other kind, they could serve a trademark role as well. But in general, for the books, for your sequels, you should copyright each book separately, I would, I would advise. Okay, great. That's good for myself to know, as well as others that are writing and illustrating their own books, to know whether they should do it as one big source of everything together or completely separate. Now, would they also need to do a separate registration with the office if somebody else is doing the layout and design of the book? So yes, if they're not going to, they can either do it as joint authors, in okay. which case they file as joint authors, or perhaps somebody hires somebody, uh, an author might hire someone to create illustrations and pay them, do it as a work made for hire, then you need a separate written agreement which specifically calls out that it's a work made for hire and that the original author of the text is going to own those illustrations. That's where you're assigning your rights. Sometimes you just allow someone to use the rights through a license or maybe through joint authorship. Remember, with joint authorship, you have to give an accounting and contribution. If you assign, if you both assign to some sort of an entity, then the entity can decide who gets what percentage of the profits, if there are any profits. Okay, so let me make sure I have this straight for everybody else that's not in the same situation for myself. So for myself, I've illustrated the entire book, I've written the entire book, I've laid out the entire book, and did the cover art. So everything is done by me. Even the photos are all mine. Um, they're all self-portraits, um, or selfies, I should say. So because the entire book is all of my creation, I am the source of everything. I would go ahead and register that book with me being the head of every area that I have touched, except for the biography, because somebody else wrote the biography, which is fine. But if somebody else is not as capable of doing everything like I have done, and they need to hire somebody out to do the illustrations, but they wrote the story or vice versa, maybe they illustrated and somebody else wrote the story, but they also need to hire a separate artist to do the cover art, front and back cover, and then they hired an additional artist to lay out the book to get it ready for a pre-press production so the printer can actually print it, they probably would need to do several different registrations for those different individuals that each have a piece into creating that book to come into that tangible item. Is that correct? Yes. 
Okay. Perfect. Yes. Yeah, so you, you you could do it again. You could do it multiple ways. You could you could buy the rights, have it assigned, or you could file jointly. Um, and it just depends on on the arrangement between the individuals. Perfect. Now let's get into rights and ownership and licensing a little bit regarding, especially when it comes down to illustration work. There's a lot of authors out there that may not do the illustration work for their books themselves. So they want to hire somebody to do the illustrations for them. And for most people, they don't understand who actually has copyright or ownership of that artwork. Some people assume because they've paid somebody to create the illustrations for their publication, they make the assumption that they own that artwork when in reality, it's actually the creator. Since I'm well aware of this being an artist and designer myself, I understand this, but for the average person that doesn't know this and also is not familiar with copyright law, can you clarify this for those individuals that are in that space? So you're a queen of contracts and you know, Stacey, that having a, having a solid contract is really critical. Here's the deal. Everybody who fixes in a medium, whatever they create, owns that copyright unless and until those rights are varied. You can give permission to someone to use it with a license. They either pay a lump sum up front or do it on royalties, or you and I have been working together 20 years. Maybe we just do it as a favor. But there has to be some sort of a license. Should be in writing, doesn't need to be in writing. Should be. Otherwise, if you want to transfer the ownership, you're assigning your rights, you're giving all your rights, and you're buying the rights from somebody that must be in writing. And you must tell the Copyright Office that you have an agreement in writing. So it could be a work made for a hire. But if I pay an illustrator to make drawings that would go along with the text of the book that I wrote, and I don't have a work made for hire agreement, an illustrator owns the rights and maybe they'll let me use them. Maybe for the amount I paid, they let me put them in the book, but that doesn't mean I bought the copyright to them. So for example, if I buy a piece of art and I got a piece of art right here behind me, I have art around my house, I love art. When you buy art, somebody maybe, maybe a, 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 an author or a painter uh, made 75 lithographs or something. Okay, when I buy one of those 75, I'm not getting the copyright. I don't have the right to reproduce it. I don't have the right to stop others from making copies. I don't have the right to publicly display it. I only have the right to put that one copy on my wall. And because of the first sale doctrine, I have the right to resell it. Like we used to do with textbooks in college, if you remember. When you're done with the textbook, you sell it to the class behind you. You're allowed to do that because you're not making a copy. You're simply selling your physical copy like you might sell the art off the wall. But if you buy an illustration for use, and you have permission, a license, that doesn't mean you can make additional copies. It doesn't mean you can use that those illustrations again in a subsequent book. That's when you need to get an assignment from the illustrator. And you need to have a solid contract that spells out the differences of what you're getting, whether you're getting just the right to display it or use it, or you're getting the actual ownership. And again, if you both assign into some kind of a corporate entity, it's much safer for everybody because then the the operating agreement can decide who has what rights and you don't have to go back to the copyright office every time. So let me ask this question. Say you're a writer, you hire an illustrator to do all your illustrations, you've gotten a contract, but you realize that contract that you signed and paid for only allows you a license to use that artwork in that one book. And after the situation has happened, you decide I want to own these illustrations. What does that look like cost-wise to that writer that wants to buy from the illustrator? And how would the illustrator determine the value to sell that artwork? Because they're going to lose royalties on that going forward if they sell their artwork outright. Can you explain some of that to people? So it partly depends on the commercial success of the book. Is the book a bestseller? Is the book something that people have been buying? Is it the kind of thing that's getting featured at, at book readings and libraries or, or having you know people come in and hear this book? Or, or is it just something that sits on a shelf collecting dust? Each, the author of the text and the illustrator have different motivations. The author wants the book to be successful, but doesn't want to pay a lot to the illustrator. The illustrator wants the book to be successful and make a lot of money. The question is, which one's correct? And it's hard to tell the difference. So sometimes what's important is to figure out whether the book has commercial success. And if it does, the price for the artwork is going to be more. That's why it's better to do these things in advance if you can. 
have a good solid agreement up front before the book is published because if you can do that it's not worth anything so people just make their own valuation decisions but once the book's been out there it's either publishing a lot and selling and therefore it's worth more or it's languishing a bit in which case it's worth less either way uh the price is going to be different later than it is earlier so for the illustrator if they're creating a contract with in with a writer to we're going to create these many illustrations for you this is our specs of what of deliverables that we're going to give you this is the type of artwork we're going to do at fine art meaning we're going to do an oil or acrylic or watercolor painting or we're going to do color pencil sketch or we're going to go digital and do something in photoshop or maybe we're going to do both we're going to start our traditional medium and then take it digitally and finish out in photoshop or illustrator and so forth and they decide that not only do they want to do the license, but they also decided we want to sell the or we want to give the author the opportunity to own the artwork. Should they in their original contract, when they're getting trying to get the contract closed with the writer, go ahead and put the buyout fee in that contract ahead of time? And if so, how much do you think or how can they decide to charge that buyout fee so they can make their money and walk away whether the book is successful or not? So it's a tricky question because it really depends on what people think of the value of their work. Obviously, the person who creates the work wants to think it has more value and the person buying the rights wants to say that it has lower value. But we both know that that could change over time and, it, and the public decides the real value. So if you do it up front, that's great, but things may change and people may try to breach the contract or get out of the contract or say that they had imperfect information or that maybe it shouldn't have gone for that price. It's it's tough to do it that way. Uh, you're better off, I think, to buy the rights up front or say, look, we'll give an option and here's the option, here's when the option expires. Um, of course, I was involved in a big lawsuit where uh, Art Buckwald, our client, sued Paramount Pictures over the moving coming to America, where Paramount had agreed to an option and then waited for the option to expire, made the movie anyway. And Art Buckwald successfully sued and got almost a million dollars in damages from them making the movie. Well, guess what? That's breach of contract, not copyright infringement. But you don't really want to get involved in a suit because although he won almost a million dollars, it cost him more than $3 million in attorney's fees to get there. So sometimes these things are not self-actuating. You may have to decide to just make a decision up front and pay whatever you think is the right price. And if you can both agree, that's great. If not, maybe you hire a different illustrator. Also, sometimes you hire somebody who has success in illustrating other people's kids' books. And if they do, you want them well, then that may cost more than you just hiring somebody who's a, a you know first time artist. So there's different factors that go into it. So when it comes to copyright and especially infringement, because I know this comes up a lot for people, how often does copyright infringement happen? All the time, all the time. Um, it's it's unfortunate, but if you go on the internet. People are constantly using other people's pictures. They're taking text from one website, putting them on another website. Um, it's it's really unfortunate how often people's creativity is stolen by somebody else. Uh, you know, they say imitation is the most sincere form of flattery. Well, imitation is also typically uh, a violation of their rights. So if you protect it, you can stop them. So what are the suggested steps to take in order to protect yourself from copyright infringement. So say you create a piece of art or you write a story, a kid's book, and somebody infringes on your work, whether it's the text or the illustrations or both, what do you do to protect yourself? A bunch of things. First of all, as I say, file for copyright protection as soon as possible. If you file within before publication, within the first three months, you can get statutory damages and attorney's fees, and that's valuable. If you put in there some fake typos, you know, intentional typos um, on your drawings. Maybe have a little signature or a little a little thing that you know is yours that that's in there that doesn't need to be in there. So maybe something on their belt or something in their pocket or some extra squiggle, something that you can later show that they actually copied, either because the typo got copied over or the uh, illustration there was some feature that didn't need to be there that you can prove that they copied. And then just be vigilant. Watch out for it. 
Um, if you see it happen, you can send your own cease and desist letter. You don't need to hire an attorney. It's always good to hire an attorney, but you don't need to. Send your own cease and desist letter and say, hey, look, you're copying my work. I see you're using this. There's actual websites where you could run text through. You put in yours, you put in theirs, and it'll tell you whether it's, it's there's any parts that are that are copied or not. Um, so there's ways to do it, but being vigilant is the best thing you can do. Get the copyright registered. Watch out for it. Make sure you put the notice on there to tell everybody. But Stacy, people are going to steal. That's what they do. Unfortunately. Now, yeah. when it comes to a series of books, does each book need to be copyrighted individually or can you copyright an entire series of books? So again, if you if you do three at once, you could do all three as saying the, the three-part series of, you know, Stacey Schilling. Um, or if you do one and then subsequently later, you do them individually. The old days, you used to be able to do compilations and Copyright Office is cracking down on that. So I would say the best practice is to do each book separately if it's one author, if it's one author slash illustrator. If it's a different author and a different illustrator, you might do those separately for each book. But I would do the book separately, not try to do seven books all at once. Okay. So basically, in 